This is part one of selected respiratory keywords for 2019. Dr. Shell has two other presentations on the same subject, but he divided the keywords between us, so there shouldn't be any overlap. These are the keywords I was assigned. The keywords covered in this presentation appear in red. The first subject to be discussed is problems related to pulse oximetry. If I were writing questions on this subject, I would focus on factors associated with poor signal quality or factors that produce inaccurate results. This slide shows a normal pulse oximetry waveform and examples of waveforms with poor signal quality. It wouldn't be unreasonable to present a waveform of poor signal quality and ask for the most likely etiology of that waveform. These are the results of a meta-analysis that evaluated 169 studies. Dyes that have a blue coloration have an impact. That includes methylene blue, isosulfan blue, and indigo carmine. The role of bright light has been argued, but clinical experience indicates there are times in the operating room when covering the probe with a blue towel or the foil package from an alcohol swab will result in a reading where none have been obtainable before. As expected, factors causing poor perfusion are associated with poor signal quality. Note that there is some disagreement about whether or not the use of vasopressors results in poor signal quality. I suspect the truth is that it's dose related. In any event, the lack of concurrence on the subject makes it difficult to use as the basis of a question. The impact of nail polish on pulse oximetry is also open to some debate. The original work done in 2002 showed that black, green, or blue nail polish resulted in a reduction in the number displayed by the pulse oximeter. More recent work, reported in 2005 and 2006, disputes that finding, and the lack of impact has been attributed to improved performance of the pulse oximeters. The role of acrylic nails is also questionable. The original work, done with clear acrylic nails, has questionable applicability to today's environment. Nonetheless, a report from the European Society of Anesthesiologists in 2018 suggests that neither nail polish nor acrylic nails have a significant impact on pulse oximetry, as evidenced by the fact that no readings varied by more than 2% from the actual value. Motion artifact is an obvious problem, not so much in the operating room as in the post-anesthesia care unit or the ICU. Recognize that electrical interference may compromise signal quality. The issue of a dirty sensor has probably been all but eliminated with the use of disposable probes. Nonetheless, be aware of the fact that blood covering the LEDs in the probe may result in compromised signal quality. Now it's time to consider the accuracy of the readings. These are the results of a meta-analysis that evaluated 169 studies. <clears throat> Note that not all factors reported to influence the accuracy of pulse oximetry are universally accepted. For example, one study evaluating the impact of anemia on the accuracy of pulse oximetry reported that it had no impact even as low as a hemoglobin of 2.5. The issues of motion artifact, decreased perfusion, dyes, and bright light have already been discussed. It is worth noting, however, that inquiring about the influence of dyes is a classic exam question. Met hemoglobin is another favorite subject relating to pulse oximetry. Here's a list of drugs that have been reported to cause met hemoglobinemia. By far the drug used in the perioperative period that is most commonly associated with met hemoglobinemia is benzocaine. Benzocaine has a tendency to produce met hemoglobin which absorbs equal amounts of the two wavelengths of light used in conventional pulse oximetry. The result is a tendency for the pulse oximeter to report a saturation as 85%. Accordingly, most pulse oximeters report a spuriously low value for SpO2 when the actual saturation is greater than 85%. Another drug that merits special consideration is prilocaine. When, you say, was the last time one of your patients received prilocaine. How about the last time a child had emla cream applied? Since the complication is dose-related, 
consider the amount of amyl cream that is sometimes slathered on a child before an IV is attempted. The presence of hypoxemia significantly impacts the accuracy of pulse oximetry. Notice that in patients with an actual saturation measured on an arterial blood gas, less than 90%, the pulse oximeter tended to overestimate the saturation. Stated another way, the very time you are likely to be most concerned about a patient's oxygenation is the time when a pulse oximeter is least accurate. Not only that, but the error is likely to not alert you to the problem or to minimize the magnitude of the problem. Certain other drugs used in anesthesia may have an impact on the accuracy of the pulse oximeter. Once again, a classic example is the interaction between deslorane and desiccated carbon dioxide absorbent to produce carbon monoxide and therefore carboxyhemoglobin, resulting in a spuriously high value of oxygen saturation being reported by the pulse oximeter. <clears throat> the problems characteristically occurred with the brand names Barolime and Amsorb, neither of which is currently available in the United States. Sulfhemoglobin is another aberrant form of hemoglobin, which has an impact on the accuracy of pulse oximetry. Sulfhemoglobin has a greenish pigmentation, and once formed, it persists for the lifespan of the red blood cell. Sulfhemoglobin, which causes the pulse oximeter to display a spuriously low value for SpO2, may be produced by metoclopramide, dapsone, phenacetin, and sulfonamides. The next subject to be considered is the issue of the relationship between abnormal capnograms and a diagnosis. A normal capnogram is often described in terms of four phases. Phase one is the inspiratory baseline. Phase two is the expiratory upstroke. Phase three is the expiratory plateau. Expiration ends and inspiration begins at the end of the expiratory plateau. Phase four is the inspiratory downstroke. Here's a list of commonly described abnormal capnogram waveforms. A bronchial intubation may present with an altered value of exhaled carbon dioxide. One study reported that in the presence of a bronchial intubation, end tidal CO2 was decreased in 23%, increased in 18%, and unchanged in 59% of patients. In any event, in most circumstances, the morphology of the waveform is essentially normal. An incompetent expiratory valve presents as failure to return to baseline. Over time, there will also be an increase in end tidal CO2. An incompetent inspiratory valve presents with an altered downslope, the slope of phase four. Remember that this occurs during inspiration. A leaking tracheal tube cuff classically presents with the failure to achieve an expiratory plateau and a markedly attenuated expiratory downstroke, phase four. Cardiogenic oscillations are synchronous with the heart rate. They were initially attributed to changes in the volume of the heart during the cardiac cycle with subsequent changes in lung volume. Work during cardiac surgery with the chest open and the vascular structures isolated demonstrated that cardiogenic oscillations are due to airflow in the lungs and conducting airways occurring as a result of changes in blood volume in the pulmonary artery. Application of positive end expiratory pressure, PEEP, has been demonstrated to eliminate cardiogenic oscillations in most circumstances. Termed a curare cleft, the decrease in the expiratory plateau occurs as a result of a spontaneous inspiratory effort during the expiratory phase of controlled mechanical ventilation. Since the ventilator prevents effective gas flow, the phenomenon is transient. For this to occur, the patient's arterial CO2 must exceed the apneic threshold, that is, the patient must be attempting to initiate a breath. 
Newer modes of ventilation, for example, pressure support ventilation, will likely recognize this as an inspiratory effort and cycle to inspiration, eliminating the appearance of the curare cleft. Treatment should consist of decreasing the arterial CO2 below the patient's apneic threshold, that is, increasing alveolar ventilation, or increasing the apneic threshold through administration of respiratory depressant, such as an opioid or a higher concentration of volatile anesthetic agent. Although additional neuromuscular blocking drug will also eliminate the curare cleft, that is masking the problem without treating the primary etiology. Airflow obstruction during exhalation is associated with loss of the alveolar plateau. Sometimes described as a shark fin waveform, it may be seen during bronchospasm, such as with asthma or COPD, a problem such as an obstruction or a kink in the expiratory limb of the ventilator circuit, a foreign body in the airway, a kinked tracheal tube, or herniation of the cuff over the tip of the tube. This is the last abnormal capnographic waveform we will consider. A leak in the sampling line presents with a unique waveform which is sometimes described as a steeple sign. The last keyword that will be covered in this part of the respiratory keywords relates to oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve characteristics. Logical questions about the oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve relate to different forms of hemoglobin and factors which shift the curve. This is a normal oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve for adult hemoglobin. First, notice that a PO2 of 60 millimeters of mercury is associated with a saturation of 90%. Second, notice that a partial pressure of 40 millimeters of mercury corresponds to a saturation of approximately 75%. These values are important because they are textbook normal values for mixed venous blood. Finally, notice that when the hemoglobin is 50% saturated, the PO2 is approximately 27 millimeters of mercury. This value is known as the P50 and is the basis for comparing oxyhemoglobin dissociation curves. This is an outstanding mnemonic. It tells you essentially everything you need to know to answer test questions regarding what effect a given change will have on the oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve. The curve is shifted to the right with a rise in 2,3 dpg concentration, hydrogen ion concentration, and temperature. The only way you can get this wrong is if you think the H stands for pH. Obviously, an increase in hydrogen ion concentration causes a decrease in pH. A shift to the right will result in an increase in the P50. A common way to ask this question is to inquire which of a series of factors is most likely to result in a change in the P50 of the curve. In order to answer the question, you must know the normal value for the P50, which direction the curve is shifted to achieve the value of the P50 listed in the question, and then the factors that will cause the curve to move in that direction. One other thing to remember about the oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve. Methemoglobin results in a left shift of the curve. This produces another basis for a question or perhaps another question completely. For example, the question could be phrased something like, administration of which of the following drugs is least likely to result in the P50 being 27 millimeters of mercury, and then provide a list of drugs associated with the formation of methemoglobin and one drug that is not associated with the formation of methemoglobin. Now for how different forms of hemoglobin affect the P50. There are more than 600 different varieties of hemoglobin, and at least hypothetically, each form could have a different P50. The most common varieties of hemoglobin are hemoglobin A, that is normal adult hemoglobin, and hemoglobin F, fetal hemoglobin. This figure compares the oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve for those two forms of hemoglobin, as well as carboxyhemoglobin and myoglobin. 
Note that the curves for carboxyhemoglobin and hemoglobin F are shifted to the left and are associated with a decrease in the P50. This figure shows the oxyhemoglobin dissociation curves for hemoglobin A and for sickle hemoglobin, hemoglobin S. Note that the curve for hemoglobin S is shifted to the right and is associated with an increased value for P50.